let's officially start the, your talk. So our next talk is by Adriana Salerno from Bates College, and she will tell us about Hasevit matrices and mirror toric pencils. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me, and thanks for uh, inviting me to this um, to this session. I, I I wasn't able to go to any of the talks last week, but I'm glad I was able to go to stuff this week. Uh, last week, I gave a talk in the finite field session, and that is very similar. So if you were there, you will see some common themes. But I tried to sort of separate the two versions, and so. Ideally, this talk will be so interesting that you'll want to find the video for the other one or the other way around. The other one was so interesting that now you're here, right? Hopefully some of that is happening. Um, this is a project that I've been working on for a while with Ursula Witcher. Um, this is her great smiling face, and um, she and I have been working on this for a few years. That's a picture from us at the Fields Institute in 2019. Um, and the goal of our project and many of the things that she and I have worked on together and with other folks is to inspiration from mirror symmetry or intuition to really prove number theory theorems or arithmetic theorems. Okay. So that's the that's the underlying motivation. And I hope I'll give you an idea of what it is that we did. Um, I'm planning on a 20 minute talk, so I can't tell you everything, but hopefully it's interesting enough that you'll want to find out. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to start with is this Hasevit matrix that um, appears in the title. And so the Hasevit matrix is this um, object that encodes some important arithmetic data about a variety, a smooth variety. So if we have a smooth variety of a finite field of order, some power of a prime, um, then we have a Frobenius operator um, that induces a linear map on the cohomology of this variety. And so um, here, pick your favorite cohomology that works over a finite field. Okay, this is, I don't mean Durham cohomology, I don't mean complex cohomology, I mean like a tau cohomology or something like that. But you know, it's not important in, at the moment because once you have this map, um, these cohomology spaces are vector spaces, so we can pick a basis and um, and then the the matrix of that map on that particular basis is what we call the Hasse bit matrix. Okay, and so this piece power of Corvinius is, is sort of encoding some arithmetic information that we'll see in a second. And that matrix form is also doing that. And so um, here's something interesting is that for a certain type of variety, it's called Calabiao varieties, which are the ones that we're gonna be focusing on in this talk, um, this cohomology space, um, because we have like a unique holomorphic n form that's part of the definition of a Calabi Yao variety, then this space is actually going to be one dimensional. And so we're going to have a one by one matrix, which is also known as a number. Um, so we're going to have just a Hasevit constant, really. Um, I will call it a matrix because there's some generalizations that we want to allow for, but like for the rest of this talk, the Hasevit matrix is just a number that encodes information related to the piece power, power of Rubinius. Okay. And so um, here's, here's the, the, the really um, cool insight. Uh, Nick Katz, um, in some much more larger work, um, he worked on this congruence formula that I'm not telling you about, but what that is is not important. That work implies that the number of points on a Calabi Yao variety mod P, so if you count the number of solutions on this variety mod P, is uh, determined by the Hasevit matrix, okay, or the Hasevit number. So this is work uh, due to Nick Katz. And, um, and he actually has a nice algorithm for figuring this out. 
Um, so this is actually not just a nice result for a, a very computable, it's something that we can calculate. Okay, we can calculate it because uh, if we have a Clabiau hypersurface sort of cut out by one equation, uh, then the matrix is given by the coefficient of a particular term to the P minus one in that P minus one power of that equation or that formula. Okay, so, um, so that is something that we can compute um, pretty straightforwardly, if that's a word. Uh, and so, um, and a lot of his work was done in the context of this particular um, type of Clabiau hypersurfaces uh, known as the Fermat pencil. So you can see that this is Fermat pencil uh, because it's sort of these n plus one powers of all the um, variables uh, and then minus this sort of one parameter term with the psi of this uh, this monomial x naught to xn. Okay, and so you get a family, a one parameter family uh, indexed by psi. And if you get another like n plus one and p are relatively prime, then we actually know because of all this work that Katz did that the Hasevit matrix or number is given by a truncated hypergeometric series. My computer just told me that my connection is unstable. Can you all still hear me? Yes, we can still hear you. Okay. I don't know why Zoom has to be so judgmental about computer connections, but whatever. Um, so the, um, this is this is sort of a really nice result in in a very particular situation. Uh, there's there's a very this is a very nicely symmetric, like beautiful uh, family, right? And uh, and that's going to come into play in a second. And because of all this work that Katz did, we know that the Hasselbit matrix, which tells us the point count of these families mod p, is actually a very nice type of function or, or um, constant based on truncated hypergeometric series. Okay, so that was very important in my previous talk. It will be less so in this one, but um, but here's something nice about um, hypergeometric functions and hypergeometric uh, equations. Um, and I'm not going to define hypergeometric functions, but just think power series with coefficients that are given by some combinatoric um, constants, basically factorials. Um, all the nice functions that you might want to think about are essentially hypergeometric. These are special functions because they're um, the functions have a very nice differential equation associated to them. So the Picard-Fuchs equation of a these Calabi-Yau hypersurfaces is a hypergeometric differential equation, and the solution is a hypergeometric series. And this is kind of how you get that the truncations of the series give you this Hasevit matrix. And so a lot, of the, all of this was done by Katz, and we're going to try to replicate some of this work. We're we're going to get at the Hasevit matrix through differential equations satisfied by the periods. And so we're doing this trick of um, really looking at the periods to get some arithmetic information. Okay, and here's the thing: what does this have to do? Uh, I said at the beginning of the of the talk that the goal is to get to exploit um, mirror symmetry intuition. So I want to tell you a little bit about mirror symmetry. This is kind of a jarring switch. Sometimes I add interlude to the title page of this one because it seems like a little bit of an aside. But um, the idea is that um, people maybe have heard about string theory. It is a proposed uh, unified theory of physics. Um, physics has a couple of very nice theories like quantum mechanics and then all this stuff with gravity they are great they explain a lot of physics but they don't play well with each other that's essentially the uh the like you know uh, pop science version of of what's going on 
Um, meaning, so locally space time looks like what we experience, which is this three dimensional space plus a time dimension. Um, what string theory proposes is that there's additional stuff, this V variety, um, that is a D dimensional complex manifold. And somehow the um, all the stuff that's happening at this sort of small plus large level can be explained by this extra uh, variety. Uh, for the physics to work, whatever that means, this is like for this to be a three complex dimensional manifold or six real dimensions. And they also want it to be a Calabi-Yau manifold, okay? Um, and so here's where mirror symmetry comes in. Somehow this extra space um, requires some sort of uh, like arbitrary decision on uh, at the level of the model, but regardless of what arbitrary decision you make at the beginning of this deciding what this V space is, you can get V or a V dual space that describe the exact same observable physics. Okay, so some mathematical decision affect the physics that you want to be explained. Again, this is the pop science version of all the stuff. This is much more complicated than that. But the idea is then for physicists, Clavier manifold appear in pairs, and these pairs explain everything we observe in, in physics. Okay. For a mathematician, this means that, I mean, these, these are not isomorphic, they're not like the same space, right? So, but for, for us, that means um, that they have to appear in pairs and there's some sort of duality, right? Like, like they're, they're different, but related by some sort of awesomeness. And so, um, and what's happening really is that in mirror symmetry for, for the physics to work, the mathematics that needs to appear has to interchange something that's related to the complex structure of our varieties with a Kähler structure or a metric. Um, Kähler, by the way, was a notorious Nazi. I feel like I always need to say it when I mention his name. So we don't like him. We use his name for some reason. All right, so then we can relate the variations of these structures, and that gives us the mirror symmetry. And I'll tell you a little bit about one mirror construction that's, um, for me, the most intuitive, and then I'll go into sort of the, the kind of stuff that we, that we worked on. Oh, and this idea of trying to get intuition about number theory from mirror symmetry um, comes, uh, started with, these three folks, Phil Vicandela, Senia de la Osa, and Fernando Rodriguez Villegas. Um, Fernando was my PhD advisor. This is sort of how I started thinking about these things. Um, and Philip and Senia are physicists. Fernando is a number theorist. And they started having conversations about sort of this arithmetic weirdness that Philip and Senia were, were observing. And so Fernando came in and started like working with them on this. And so I, I feel like we can attribute the beginning of these, this uh, story to, to the three of them. Um, and the first sort of mirror construction. So people work on, on creating mirror constructions, meaning they want to define pairs of Glabiao manifolds that have the right duality. Okay, And uh, it's not even known that this is true that all Calabi-Yau manifolds are paired in some way, but you can construct some examples. And so the first one is due to Green and Plesser. Um, and uh, so the idea is you start with the Fermat pencil, the one that Katz explored uh, quite deeply. Um, let's think about the Fermat Quintic, which is a Calabi-Yau threefold. That's the kind that the physicists like. This is a highly symmetric pencil, meaning that you can act on it by um, basically fifth roots of unity. So five tuples of fifth roots of unity, as long as they sort of multiply to uh, like a to the identity, right? So like if you replace each one of these variables by that variable times a fifth root of unity, all of this is fixed. And then if you add this extra condition, then this is fixed. 
And so basically it's isomorphic to C mod five Z cubed because it's also homogeneous. So you, you forget about like multiplying by scalars. And so then, um, then you have this nice group action. So you can quotient by that group action and resolve singularities. And what you get is what we call the mirror family. Okay, so basically this is, this is how you get that duality uh, in this instance. And there have been many other constructions and some of the work that I've done with Ursula and other folks has been about like a different type of mirror construction. Um, what has been observed um, by people for a long time is that there is also an arithmetic pattern is that if you look at the point counts mod Q over a finite field FQ, the uh, varieties in their mirror have the same point count. Okay, so now we're getting back to the arithmetic. Um, and in fact, that chain one um, actually found that for you know degree n plus one Calabi Yau varieties and the green plesser mirror, this is always true. Okay, this this is true for every FQ to the K. And so then um, Ursula and a student of hers, uh, Chris Magyar, um, actually observed this in other situations, and then they decided to just take this. Say that uh, if you have these two varieties um, that have the same point count in this sense, there are a mirror pair and have this point counting condition, then what we call it is a strong mirror pair. Okay. And so um, so there's this, this additional sort of arithmetic that we're interested in. And what Ursula and I have been working on is extending all of these ideas to families that are realized as toric hypersurfaces. I absolutely do not have time to tell you everything about toric varieties, but I'll give you a taste of what we've done. Okay. And so um, there's another mirror construction, and this one is due to Batiro, where you can describe mirror families of Clabio manifolds using things called reflexive polytopes. Reflexive polytopes look like this, or polytopes look like these pictures that I'm showing you. In fact, all three-dimensional, two and three-dimensional polytopes have been completely classified. And so when you type in Sage polytope 10, it shows you this guy. When you type 4,314, it shows you this guy. I think there's like 4,700 of them fully classified. So there's like databases of them. And so these are the ones that we focused on. A reflexive polytope is a lattice polytope, meaning that it has the vertices on a lattice. Um, and uh, there's a polar dual that I did not define, but there's there's a, some, some way of, of constructing a dual polytope. And if it's reflective, then the dual of the dual is the original thing that doesn't always happen. And we call these two a mirror pair. And there's um, a lot of um, work that one needs to do to associate these to a hypersurface like the ones I was showing you earlier. But essentially, you can define a toric variety using these polytopes. And then you can sort of nail down some coefficients and you can write down this hypersurface inside that toric variety. And those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. Those are going to be Calabi-Yau. Um, and so they're going to have the right properties that we want. And in fact, the dual that you get by just doing this duality with the polytopes gives you exactly a mirror in the um, toric variety. And so it's a really nice construction. And at the bottom of it, and this is why Ursula could work on this with a, with, with a student that didn't have a ton of background, is that it's very combinatorial. You don't have to understand all of the, all of the theory about toric varieties. And so here's here, these two are duals of each other in this sense. And so there's polytope three and polytope 4,283. Um, and then there's another condition uh, that we added. We're going to talk about them being combinatorially equivalent if there's a bijection between the faces. Okay, so we just want it to be like exactly the same type of polytopes. And so, for example, these four polytopes are combinatorially equivalent. Um, the, the top rows are duals, but then bottom, top bottom 
So the top row is their duals and the bottom are duals, but then top and bottom are combinatorially equivalent. So we can sort of classify them and group them by, by these sort of nice combinatorial properties. And so this is what Ursula and I proved, um, is that if you have polytopes that are combinatorially equivalent, they're the associated hypersurfaces, and um, then the Hasevit matrices are the same. And, uh, and then two is that basically we know they're at least the same plus a constant. We actually haven't finished figuring out whether we need that constant or not, but we know that if one is satisfied, then the Hasevit matrices are the same. And so then the upshot, oh, and here's like a taste of the proof. Um, there's a nice result by Huang, Lian, Yao, and Yu that relates half a bit matrices to Picard Fuchs equations. So this is the same story I was telling you about cats. Like what we do is we talk about arithmetic by talking about differential equations, which is sort of fun. Um, then Ursula and Chris actually showed that if you satisfy the torque uh, criteria, then the Picard Fuchs equations are the same. There's a little bit more work to do. But in the end, like what we prove is, is this theorem that the Hasevit matrices are the same. There's sort of subtle work to do there, but. And then the upshot is, because of all the stuff I mentioned with cats, that the point counts are the same. Um, examples, so I'm gonna go through this example, but we can group them by this combinatorial equivalence. And so here's all these, um, these polytopes, again, indexed by these numbers. Um, and here's what the, the Calabi-Yau hypersurface equations in a, the toric variety look like. And so for example, polytope three, which was at the top left, it's this nice equation. And for polytope 753, which is bottom left, is this annoying thing. But here's the thing that we did, is that you don't have to compute the point count for 753, because it's the same as the one for polytope three. And so what you get is that a way of like doing a lot of computations very quickly by only computing it for the easiest one. And that's what we did. But we do it through the differential equation. So we can find the Picard Fuchs equation for the top one, which is this. And we find that this is equivalent to this hypergeometric differential equation. And we need to do a change of variables um, to get it to look right. And then it's, this is still, uh, hypergeometric and so then we get the exact point count is this truncated hypergeometric function so this is what we what we did was replicate a lot of what cats had done for the fermat pencil okay and so here's here's what we did counting points on k3 surfaces is hard this is a difficult thing but we using information about the periods and these differential equations we extracted the extracted the information the arithmetic information quickly and for multiple related families we didn't just do it for one family. We did it for a whole grouping of them. And so that's cool. Uh, so that's the main thing that I wanted to tell you about today. Um, you can find more details in our archive paper. Um, here's the code, but like, I think this will be shared because it's being recorded. Um, you can also see, because there's a cool consequence to, to that like example that I just show you related to sort of um, symmetric squares and uh, Clausen's formula and so a lot of are fun hypergeometric consequences. So you can watch the talk I gave at the finite field session last week. Um, and, and it's recorded and it's on the easily accessible on the forum or YouTube. Um, so thank you. Gracias. Merci. Obrigada. Thank you very much.